This woman later identified herself as the Mother of God, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and this became what we now know as Our Lady of Fatima. But what's interesting is, is that the, the entire thing sounds a whole lot like UFO encounters that we hear about all the time today. Again, close encounters of the third kind. What's especially suggestive about this is that there was one significant sign or wonder or miracle that surrounded this that was most noteworthy. And that is, on one particular day, this started to attract a lot of attention, as these things will. I'm sure a lot of you have seen media reports a few years ago about the Medjugorje apparitions over in, in what is now, I think, Bosnia or one of those countries. Um, but people tend to flock to these things because people are hungry for true spirituality. And when they see something miraculous, they think they're going to find it there. But in this case, there were like 10 or 20,000 people that had gathered because these apparitions have been going on for some time. And all of a sudden, they, they were told there was going to be a sign. And of course, what does Jesus say? A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. But here's what happened. It was cloudy. It was rainy, or drizzly at least. And all of a sudden, the sun broke through the clouds and began to do barrel rolls and began to fly around the sky like it was being piloted by a demented screwball. It flew hither and yon, back and forth, to the amazement of the crowds. It was like watching the ultimate light show because this thing was as bright as the sun. They thought it was the sun. And to this very day, devout Catholics believe that God did that miracle, that he had the sun fly through the sky like, you know, some kind of idiot video game. Well, the problem with that theory is, I don't doubt for a minute God could do that. I mean, God, I mean, God did a pretty good trick with the sun for Joshua, amen? But the problem is, nobody else outside of Portugal saw this. I mean, you know, I would think if the sun was doing all this bizarre stuff, people would see it over in New York, or they'd see it in France, or they'd see it in Italy. But nobody outside of the immediate environs of the city of Fatima saw this. To me, that leaves a very obvious explanation. This was a UFO. It was a lying sign and wonder. And it has deceived millions, because millions of people still visit that shrine every year. And the Pope, as you may know, is very, very fond of it. Um, and of course, there have been many such similar apparitions at Garabandal, at, at Lourdes, at, at Medjugorje, and there are others. There's even, an, there's even a Marian cult, that's what these are called, with full-blown Marian apparitions just a few hundred miles north of here in the seat of Wisconsin. I know, I used to be a part of it. <laughs> Not time to go into that one, I'm afraid. That's a whole other story. But anyway, see what the pattern is. God uses one, or not God, the devil uses wonders, uses signs, uses amazing things to deceive people. And now we're in an age where we look at things like that and we think nuts and bolts. We think technology. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, maybe it's something more. Okay, let's look at what's going on here. I've already mentioned our old friend, I'll put his ugly puss up here again. Alistair Crowley. Now, this guy, I mean, this guy has his handprint on everything evil that happened, it seems that it happened in, in this century. In fact, he even take, took the credit for creating Adolf Hitler, believe it or not. Of course, the guy obviously had a little bit of an ego problem. In fact, he once made the statement that the highest spiritual experience any woman, he didn't think much of women, uh, could ever experience was having sex with Alistair Crowley. So, the guy obviously, you know, had a lot of self-esteem. I mean, our psychologist today would really love him. Anyway, he began having communications with extraterrestrial beings. That was his word. With this EWAS back in 1904. What's interesting is that just three years after that, in 1907, was the, one of the most spectacular close encounters that we ever have known about with a UFO, and that was in Tunguska, Siberia. Something. We don't know what it was because nobody actually saw this. As you probably know, Siberia is not very well populated. But something came down out of the sky and exploded over this isolated part of Siberia with a force greater than many, many megatons. And this was, of course, 40 years before the invention of the H-bomb or the H-bomb. 
and it was so powerful it flattened trees for 10 miles in every direction and it left a residue of nuclear radiation which is so powerful it killed everything within 150 miles now most meteors and of course some of you may have even seen that dippy thing they had on TV a few weeks ago the asteroid thing and and we understand that an asteroid can hit with an incredible amount of force but they don't usually leave nuclear radiation residue unless it's a radioactive ice asteroid and so some people have thought that this was a UFO that crashed in Siberia. The next thing that happened was that Crowley had a contact with another extraterrestrial that identified itself as Lam. That was the, guy, the little guy's name. He was short, and he let Crowley draw a picture of him. And oddly enough, this is very much what the picture looked like. This is the classical modern UFO. This is from a very popular book on alien abductions by a, a horror writer named Whitley Stryber, except this story is supposedly true, as it says there. He claims that he is an alien abductee. Uh, anyhow, it's interesting that, like, you know, 40 years before we knew such aliens existed, that Aleister Crowley was having conversations with them and drawing pictures of them. Uh, this man developed a whole system of magic which has come to be called Transuguthian magic. I mentioned that before. And, and a lot of stuff was written about it from the context of a, of a contemporary of Crowley's who was a, a pretty well-known horror writer nowadays. He wasn't well-known back then, named Howard Phillips Lovecraft, H.P. Lovecraft for short. And Lovecraft wrote all of these books like the Dunwich Horror, the Shadow Out of Time, the Color Out of Space, the Shadow Over Innsmouth. And these were very different kind of horror novels. And they're not like Stephen King because these were written in a more gentle time. And they were very genteel horror novels. It sounds like a contradiction in terms. But, but they were horror novels with a science fiction twist. They were about aliens from outer space that came here that were incredibly malignant, incredibly powerful. And their appearance was such that if a man would even look at one for an instant, it would drive him hopelessly insane forever. And these were called the great old ones. And these beings could be accessed through forbidden books like the Necronomicon. A lot of people thought the Necronomicon was fictional. It isn't. In fact, today you can buy a book in any Walden bookstore that has about half the Necronomicon in it. And it's a very, very dangerous book. Um, a lot of people think Lovecraft just made this stuff up. But there's a lot of evidence that his grandfather was involved in Egyptian Freemasonry. And so he had access to this. And whether he himself was a magician or whether he was just writing about this stuff to sort of exorcise his personal demons, we don't know. But we do know that Lovecraft was a very weird individual. Most of his life he lived with two maiden aunts. He would never go underground. He feared the subways. He would never go within the sight of the ocean. He feared the ocean. Uh, he had correspondences with many of the other great horror and science fiction writers of his day, but I don't believe he ever actually traveled and met any of them. And he died more or less a lonely, only moderately successful writer because he really didn't get really popular until in the 1960s, and he's been dead now for many years. But the interesting thing is, Many, many, pardon me, many occult writers that are experts on Crowley and his philosophies and teachings have noted that there's some exact correspondences between these fictitious supposed monsters and Crowley's real gods. And the important thing I want you to get from this little mini discussion is that these are aliens that are worshipped as gods. These are aliens that are supposedly so ancient that they were old when Jehovah was in knee pants. That's the word of one occult writer. And so these are incredibly powerful, incredibly ancient gods that come here. One of them is slumbering in the Pacific Ocean. His name is Kluhu. 
Um, and, and interestingly enough, one of the books, and this will really tickle you, I think, one of his most famous books was called The Shadow Over Innsmouth. And it was about uh, how a little New England city on the coast of the Atlantic had frog-like beings coming out of the ocean and having sex with mortal women in Masonic lodges in the town and producing Batrachian offspring, frog-like offspring that would be amphibious, intelligent, humanoid life forms. Kind of strange, huh? Another one of his books, The Dunwich Whore, involved a ritual in which a human woman ha was forced in a ritual to have sex with a powerful alien being and produced a monster, a half-human, half-something else that was so horrible that it drove men mad. And, and this is very much the stuff of modern UFO abduction, from the miscegenation, from the idea of interbreeding angels and humans, or aliens and humans, from the idea of, uh, of people coming out of the water or people coming up from under the earth and doing this, because as I think many of you know if you'd studied UFOs, is a lot of them seem to come out of the ocean and a lot of them seem to come out of the earth. There's been a lot of discussion and I believe there that these stories are absolutely true from my resources and my involvement in this prior to being saved, that there are huge underground bases in the west especially the Southwest, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and so on, where some of these things are stored. So maybe Lovecraft had a lot to be afraid of when he went underground. Maybe he had a lot to be afraid of when he looked at the ocean. But we don't have anything to be afraid of because we are bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay. We are in the last days now, I believe, and the war is heating up fast. Preachers are dropping like flies. Christians are wandering around wrecked and wounded. The conspiracy is raging ever more powerful. And remember, in this war, we only have one real offensive weapon, the sword of the Spirit, the Holy Bible. I just would ask you, does yours shoot blanks? That's all I have for you tonight. Uh, I'm going to turn the time back over to Stan, and he has a few closing words. Thank you.